Dankjewel. Dames en heren, en zo hoort dat eh, als er een gesprek plaatsvindt in Europa dat het toe doet. Een volle zaal, een mooie zaal, de Bonbonnière in Maastricht. Ik eet u allen van harte welkom hier namens de Universiteit Maastricht, maar vooral ook namens het University College Maastricht, waarvan ik zelf de decaan ben. Eh, en ik ben ontzettend blij en vereerd dat wij mogen optreden eh, als gastheer eh, vanavond van eh, een gesprek met... Frans Timmermans, de eerste vice-president van de Europese Commissie. Mijn naam is Mathieu Segers. Ik zal proberen het gesprek in goede banen te leiden en mij vooral faciliterend opstellen. En ik zal er natuurlijk voor zorgen dat wij de heer Timmermans de atmosfeer en setting geven die nodig is voor een serieus gesprek over de huidige stand van zaken in Europa, want daar is alle aanleiding toe. Ik zei het al, we zijn vereerd met de komst van Frans Timmermans naar zijn geboortestad Maastricht. En dat ook nog eens een keer aan de vooravond van 25 jaar verdrag van Maastricht, wat morgen in deze stad ook in de vorm van een event uh, zal worden uh, 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 onderstreept. Veel belangrijker dan zo'n event is natuurlijk directe communicatie. Uh, en daarom uh, deze avond hier vanavond. Ik heb het al gezegd, er is genoeg aanleiding voor gesprek, dus uh, ik maak het niet meer lang. Ik geef u nu alleen nog een paar praktische aanwijzingen. De eerste zeer belangrijke aanwijzing is dat u kunt twitteren uh, over dit gesprek uiteraard. En dan gebruikt u hashtag EU Dialogues. Hashtag EU Dialogues. U kunt ook via Twitter uh, u feedback geven op wat er hier gebeurt. Uh, en dat geldt ook voor al onze internationale gasten hier vanavond. Uh, en daartegen zeg ik in het bijzonder... It's also possible to ask your questions in other languages than Dutch. Uh, dat zal geen probleem zijn. Uh, er is simultaan vertaling aanwezig. En uh, u kent de kwaliteiten van de heer Timmermans op dit punt ongetwijfeld. Uh, dus ook wat dat betreft uh, geen problemen. Um, dan moet ik u nog uh, het volgende laten weten. Behalve dat ik u hier welkom heet in de zaal, heet ik ook iedereen welkom die dit gesprek volgt via de livestream, uh, via een van de beschikbare uh, kanalen waar dat wordt aangeboden. Dan de praktische aanwijzingen. Als u een vraag heeft, steekt u dan alstublieft duidelijk uw hand op. Ik zal voortdurend in de zaal rondkijken. Ik zal dan aanwijzen... Uh, als u de vraag kunt stellen. En dan is het belangrijk dat u meteen opstaat, uh, zodat de mensen die de camera's bedienen ook weten wie de vraag gaat stellen en dat op de juiste manier kunnen registreren. Dan nog een punt van aandacht. U heeft op uw stoel, als het goed is, allemaal een evaluatieformulier gevonden. Wij vragen u uh, namens uh, de Europese Commissie uh, om dat in te vullen voordat u weer vertrekt vanavond. Uh, ook dat is belangrijke informatie. En dan nog een allerlaatste punt. Maakt u gebruik van de simultaanvertaling en heeft u dus een koptelefoon uh, genomen bij binnenkomst. Legt u die dan alstublieft weer op uw stoel uh, voordat u vertrekt, zodat deze weer verzameld kunnen worden. Dat was het wat mij betreft. Uh, ik open uh, de dialoog. Is er iets Europeeser dan een gesprek voeren? Ik weet het niet, maar het is in ieder geval uh, een zeer Europese manier van doen. Uh, wees kritisch, direct, duidelijk uh, en open. Uh, en dan wordt het een mooie avond. Ik denk dat we moeten vragen, meneer Timmermans, ik weet niet hoe u er tegenaan kijkt, wie de eerste vraag wil stellen. Mag ik toch even zeggen dat ik heel dankbaar ben dat University College Maastricht samen met de vertegenwoordiging van de commissie in Nederland in recordtijd, in minder dan een week dit voor elkaar heeft uh, gekregen. En mag ik ook zeggen dat ik... Jullie kunnen jezelf niet zien. Jullie zien twee mannen op een podium. Ik zie jullie. Het is zo geweldig om jullie hier allemaal in de zaal uh, te zien. Uh, veel jonge mensen, maar niet alleen maar jonge mensen. Studenten ongetwijfeld, maar niet alleen maar studenten. 
Laten we eens een avond een gesprek voeren over Europa. Het woord is aan jullie en ik zal proberen zo goed mogelijk uh, jullie van dienst te zijn met mijn antwoorden vanavond. Geweldig dat jullie er allemaal zijn. Dank je wel. Oké, okay, nou, ik denk dat we dan even kunnen beginnen. En... En dan openen we nu het gesprek. Wie kan ik als eerste het woord geven? Hartelijk dank. Very good question. How can we improve on the implementation of EU uh, legislation? What I would like to say in response to your question, one of the biggest challenges we face as European is what I would call the issue of moral hazard on many, many uh, fronts in the European Union. Moral hazard is, as you know, something that was applied to the banking sector uh, in the beginning. But what I see is that moral hazard has become a fact of life in all sectors in Europe, between within member states and between member states. If, let's look at within member states first. The crisis, which has been uh, uh, multifaceted, uh, was one of the worst crises this continent has ever seen in terms of loss of wealth and position. One of the consequences of the crisis is that inequalities in Europe have increased terribly, especially between the broader middle classes and everybody is above that. And this has led to a feeling of moral hazard. People in the middle classes all over Europe feeling abandoned by people who are doing well and they don't feel that they're part of that improvement in life. They feel they need to pay for the banks, but they don't see any improvement in their lives. That's the first element of moral hazard within societies. But this element of moral hazard has spread also in the relationship between societies. You know this very well, uh, countries in the southern Europe who say this policy of implementing the Stability and Growth Pact is austerity imposed by German uh, economic doctrine that is killing us off. And in the north of Europe, uh, countries say, hey, we are paying to people in the south who are too lazy to work. We don't want to do that anymore. That's also moral hazard between member states, not seeing what the common interest is in European uh, cooperation. And this has happened in the economic crisis. It is what affects us in fighting terrorism. It is what affects us in fighting the migration crisis. And if we don't overcome this, if we don't rediscover the fact that we are in this together and that sometimes you have to give and take as well to come to a compromise, then the fundamental issue of the Commission being able to enforce the rules is only also going to be disputed very much, very often. And I said this today also in the Dutch Parliament. We love the rules. Europe is great if Europe does what we want. Europe is bad, should go if it does something we don't want. That has changed in the last 10 years. In the past, you would say, okay, I don't like this. It's not good, I think, for me, but in the framework of the greater good, okay, I'll accept that. But now we are in a situation of a zero-sum game. I only want things that are good for me, and I don't care about the wider good. And this is simply a reflection of what is happening in societies. And if we don't fix it in societies, we will certainly not fix it between uh, member states and at the level of the European Union. And simply by saying the Commission should implement, implement, we can only implement if there is a political and legal consensus that the rules apply to everyone in the same way. Is there another question? Yes, in the back. It can also in the Netherlands. Hè, that can also. And even in Maastricht. It can in Maastricht. Dus alles is mogelijk wat betreft het vraagstel. Ga het gang. Does it work? Yes. Um, my name is Hannah Brodersen. I'm from Germany. 
I would ask my question in German now, as I know you, you do, but I think many of us wouldn't understand, so I, I guess I'll stick to English. Um, I would like to know, since we're celebrating also the Treaty of Maastricht here right now, or I think tomorrow in a bigger event, um, if, you, if you were the one and only decision maker, oh. and if you could <laughs> start from scratch, which institutions of the European Union would you establish and how would they function? How would the distribution of powers um, be according to your wishes? Are you a lawyer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer, so I know where you come from. The problem in, in, in real life and in politics with the complexity of our societies we don't have the luxury of starting from scratch. But if I look at Europe as it is today and our societies as uh, they are today, I would not fundamentally change anything, but I would caution, especially smaller member states, in believing in the illusion that by going for an intergovernmental cooperation, you can safeguard your own position better than by what we have now uh, been calling the community method uh, for so long. Um, so I believe that looking back at European integration, something that now is very often seen as a threat, is actually an innovation of historic importance. The fact that you would say in Europe, with our history, that whatever my position is, whether I'm a big state or a small state, I accept, I accept the prerogative of the law. I accept to be governed by a treaty and I accept the rule of law as the guiding principle for our relationship. And this, I think, is an innovation that was brought about by the Founding Fathers. And I think this is an innovation we need to cherish. I think it's an innovation that has the potential to be an export product if you see that in other parts of the world people are coming to terms with the fact that interdependence will only increase. But some of this has been lost uh, because of the feeling that, like in the Brexit debate but other debates, that we are no longer in control of our destinies. And Europe has become an instrument of losing that control instead an, of an instrument of helping us regain that control. So if I could go back to the drawing board, I might change many, many things, and many things could be better, but I would hang on to one very, very important principle, and that is the community method, which is decision-making based on qualified majority, on, on proposal of the Commission, by co-decision of Council, and the European Parliament. We have forgotten to see the beauty of that system. But if we tear it down and break it down, we will miss it terribly later down the road. So I hope we could preserve uh, this as a principle of cooperation at the European level for the years to come. Okay. Sorry, lawyer's answer. Here, in the front, yes. Uh, I'm from Bulgaria, but... Oh, thank yes. you. Yep. Hello, Mr. Timmermans. Uh, my name is Tanev. Uh, I'm from Bulgaria. I'm also a law graduate here, but my, my question would be more from the political side, let's say. Uh, European Union is definitely a great project and unique, uh, but nowadays, for example, the migration crisis is a top challenge and a big issue. And how can the European Commission and Europe uh, as a whole actually resist to the threat uh, that... Uh, we can see from, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, Erdogan's statement that if he opens the floodgates, then this will be a big problem for Europe, especially for uh, member states like Greece or Bulgaria, because we are on the front line. This is just uh, our uh, uh, location. And how can this community method actually support uh, also Italy and all member states that uh, will have problems? Thank you. Again, in the refugee crisis, like I said earlier, moral hazard is what's causing the biggest problem. The feeling that for a long time, countries like Greece and Italy, uh, they have been ringing our bells and saying, listen, 
We know Dublin is Dublin, but so many people are coming into our country. We can't cope with this on our own, according to the Dublin rules. We need more solidarity at the European level. And the only reaction they got was, Dublin is Dublin, those are the rules, take care of it yourselves. And after a while, these countries decided, okay, they don't want to listen, sorry, but we'll start waving through. We'll start putting a red carpet over the Alps and we'll let people go through and they'll take care of it when they arrive in Germany or elsewhere because they don't want to listen to us. So then the feeling was, in the South, we are being abandoned by the rest of Europe and in the North, hey, the South is not applying the rules. And that's where everything went wrong in the migration crisis and this is what we need to fix. Now here, the problem internally is the fact that if you want to fix this, because we are now faced with a very acute refugee crisis linked to armed conflict, but make no mistake, migration issues will stay with us for a generation or two. Just look at the demographic developments in Africa. Just look at the lack of development, the lack of um, uh, the increase of inequalities where we would like to see more equality. And if you want to handle that, you can only come up with common European solutions. Solidarity will have to be part of that solution. And countries like Greece, Italy and Bulgaria on the Balkan routes need to feel that the rest of Europe understands that they have a specific problem and that they can count on solidarity from the rest of Europe. I think if we manage that in the next couple of years, and frankly we've made some steps in the right direction, then this migration issue becomes an issue that is difficult hard to tackle, but not impossible to tackle. If we continue by believing in this illusion that you can stop the problem by building fences and walls, you will only create a bigger problem down the road. Uh, you know, as a Dutchman, I have a simple metaphor to show this. Through the ages, the Dutch have learned first to build dikes because that kept the water out. But now they understand that if you try and manage water only by building higher dikes, sooner or later the water will spill over the dike and the higher the dike, the bigger the tragedy afterwards. And I think in the migration policy it's exactly the same. So what did the Dutch do with water? Canalized it, gave the water more space, looked for sustainable solutions. We need to do the same in migration. Look at our demographic developments. We will be needing more people in Europe in the future to support our economy, to support our uh, social model. We need a system of legal migration to the European Union. We also need a system of compacts with states of origin where people are coming from that don't have the right to international protection and should be returned to their countries. We need to find a way so that parents no longer send their children in the hands of smugglers to the European Union to be used as slaves in prostitution, in criminal markets, etc. We need to do something about that. It is our moral duty let me end on one thing in this area, as many other areas. If we relinquish our moral duty because we are afraid, we lose more than just a decent refugee policy. We lose our souls. And if we don't stay in touch with the moral reasoning for being Europeans, the moral value-based elements of European cooperation, the eternal market, the common currency, they're not going to save us if we don't get in touch with our values. And the refugee crisis is the most acute issue where we need to stay closely in touch with our values to find sustainable solution based on solidarity and fair burden sharing uh, between all European nations. Okay. Sorry. Um. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes, where are yeah. you? Uh, up there. The uh, European Union. When we started with the European Union, yes. we were very idealistic. Yeah. I'm almost 88 years, so I was at the beginning of the European Union. And Paul Henri Spark spoke very eloquently about what his vision was. But the European Union grew. Were we not too eager for growth to get too many countries? 28. And is it possible to get a, a a uh, solution for difficult things to deal with it. Is it not better and is it not very uh, difficult that the North and the South are economically so much different in mentality but also in economics? Is it not 
uh, I should like to know your vision. Is it not better to split it up in two? So the, uh, the strong countries and the other countries uh, like uh, circles with less responsibility and less help. You have, sir, with your age, a long memory of European integration. People who have less of a memory of that sometimes think that a common currency, the internal market, are goals in themselves. But you, with your long memory, know that they're only instruments to achieve more stability, more prosperity, more social justice, peace and prosperity across the European continent. Did we enlarge too quickly? You can say that. But that takes us back also to the Treaty of Maastricht. The Treaty of Maastricht needed to come about in a hurried way because of the end of the European divide that just overwhelmed us. I was a student in France in 1985. We had a discussion at the university with a group comparable to this, international students. And a French colonel stood up and he said, my biggest fear is the reunification of Germany. Because the reunification of Germany means that NATO will fall apart and that Germany will take a neutral position and we will have new challenges in Europe. And then the German students stood up as one woman and one man and said, this guy's crazy. I'm talking about 1985. This guy's crazy. We have two Germanys and we will always have two Germanys. History has a tendency to surprise us from time to time. Four years later, we had one Germany. And because of the end of the European divide, there was a huge sense of urgency to spread the stability we had to our new free countries next door. And I can understand people who say, we went too quickly. But let me just raise the argument. Had we not done that then, and we would have missed the historic opportunity to transform these societies, even though that transformation is not finished yet by a long shot. Had we missed that opportunity, what Mr. Putin does now in Ukraine, he would have done in the Baltic states, he would have done in Poland, he would have done in the Czech Republic, he would have done in Slovakia. So for the long-term stability of Europe, I think even though the price was very high, the price we would have had to pay had we not taken this historic step, in my analysis, would have been much, much, much higher. Now, does that mean that we have to tackle with huge diversity in the European Union between East and West and North and South? Yes. Is that a problem? Boy, I have headaches about this every day. But I also have the sense, I have a sense of my history, of how I see history. And I have to tell you, with all the headaches we have, with all the diversities we see in Europe, if I now, I took my kids last year, last year, I took my kids, the two oldest ones, 30 and, and 27 years old, on a road trip to the Baltic States. Because as a young diplomat, I'd worked in Moscow and I'd gone to the Baltic States who were then fighting for their freedom. And people were being killed in the streets of Vilnius and Riga and Tallinn. I remember that very well as a young diplomat. And I took my kids to those countries. And I was in a permanent state of wonder and, and overwhelmed and saying, look guys, they have the same currency as we do. No borders between them. Look at these young people, they look exactly like you. And to my son I said, look, it's full of hipsters here. It's not just you. <laughs> and, and you know, and my kids were like, yeah. Yeah, and in that reaction of my kids is in a nutshell what the beauty but also the problem of Europe is. The beauty of Europe is that for my kids this is completely self-evident. The problem of Europe is that for my kids this is completely self-evident. Because at the end of the day it is not. What we have made can also be destroyed. I think Mr. Segers has been making that, stating that case as well recently. And if we're not very careful, if we don't mobilize my kids' generation to take this project in their hands, to mold it in the way they want it, to make something better out of it, I think we will lose more than we can gain. 
And I honestly do not believe that by creating two different eurozones or two different currency areas in the European Union, our problems will become smaller. Because what we do not need is more economic divergence within the eurozone. I don't believe that is the solution. Does that mean that we don't have problems? I wish that were true. We have serious problems, especially problems of a lack of structural reform. So we need to continue to work on that. But my direct answer to your question is, no, sir, I don't believe a solution would be um, uh, splitting the eurozone. Because in the economy of today and tomorrow, believing that in the traditional southern European way, you can inflate your way out of this crisis is nonsense. Because the problem is not the value of the currency. The problem is the lack of structural reform. And you cannot take away that by devaluating your currency. Sorry for being long in this answer, but I think it's a fundamental question. And it's a topical issue. Uh, yes. Uh. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. It worked. Uh, ja, ik heb een vraag uh, in het Nederlands, slecht Nederlands, want ik ben een Duitser, maar Heel goed. ik probeer het, mee, uh, probeer het wel. Dank u wel. Ja. Nog niks gezegd in al applaus. Uh, ja, ja um, u heeft uh, gesproken over uh, uh, de regels uh, die uh, moeten worden ingehouden en... Um, die heel belangrijk zijn uh, dat, uh, dat de Europese uh, project kan werken. Maar dan heeft u uh, het voorbeeld gegeven of, uh, van de, uh, de Dublin-regels, uh, waar uh, de Zuid-Europese landen gezegd hebben, we kunnen het niet meer doen uh, en hebben de vluchtelingen doorgelaten en nu... Uh, ja, kunnen we het niet, uh, niet managen of niet zo goed managen als we het willen. Dus soms zijn regels uh, zo gemaakt dat het niet mogelijk is uh, ze te implementeren of te respecteren. En hetzelfde hebben we ook in de, in de eurocrisis uh, met uh, 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 waar ook de regels uh, uh, worden beslissen en dan... Nu kunnen we dat uh, niet meer en moeten de regels modificeerd worden. En, ja. dus, en, en dit probleem krijgen we altijd als we regels doen in een intergouvernementale weg. Ja. Dus wat kunnen we doen voor de toekomst dat, uh, dat we de, de regels niet meer maken met uh, lidstaat tegen lidstaat en de sterkste lidstaat krijgt uh, wat de sterkste lidstaat wil en, en of, of we kregen, um, kregen een beslissing tussen lidstaten die niet kijkt naar de uh, ja, naar de greater good um, dus ja hoe kunnen we uh, hoe kunnen we doen dat de, dat de lidstaten niet meer kunnen um, uh, ja to, uh, to overtake uh, the the entire system uh, and, and sidelining the, the European Parliament and, and you know, thereby the representation of the European people. So, uh, antwoord in het Nederlands of Engels. Ja, oké. Okay. Is het. Ik zal proberen in Nederlands. Um, als er geen politieke wil is, dan is in de moderne tijd het alleen maar zeggen, maar dat zijn de regels en u moet de regels handhaven, anders... Uh, staat u voor de rechter niet meer afdoende. Dan staan we maar voor de rechter en we zien wel. Uh, a rule of law, de rechtsstaat, kan alleen maar functioneren als er consensus is dat we de regels van de rechtsstaat respecteren. Want de rechtsstaat kan zichzelf niet beschermen anders dan door de consensus die er bestaat dat die rechtsstaat het waard is om verdedigd te worden. Dat is toch ook een les uit de Europese geschiedenis, zou ik willen zeggen. En een van de misverstanden die weer terug dreigt te komen in de Europese samenleving... is dat je de democratie tegen de rechtsstaat kan gebruiken. Met andere woorden, en dat zie ik helaas in een groeiend aantal lidstaten... we hebben de meerderheid. Dus wij zeggen wat de rechtsstaat is. Terwijl 
democratie, dat wisten de Grieken, oude Grieken al, democratie is in essentie veel meer het respect voor de positie van de minderheid dan het doorzetten van de mening van de meerderheid. En als we dat gevoel verliezen in de Europese samenleving, of dat nou in landen is of tussen landen, dat je alleen maar beter wordt als je rekening houdt met de positie van de minderheid, als we dat gevoel verliezen, dan dreigen we af te glijden in de tirannie van de meerderheid. En in onze diverse samenleving, waar we eigenlijk, als je het op Europese schaal bekijkt, zijn er twee dingen die mensen ontgaan. We hebben twee soorten lidstaten. Kleine lidstaten en lidstaten die nog niet weten dat ze kleine lidstaten zijn. En daarnaast hebben we op Europese schaal gezien alleen maar minderheden. Iemand is altijd ergens een minderheid. En als we dus die twee begrippen niet in ons politiek en juridisch handelen voortdurend incorporeren en denken dat we met veto's kunnen werken, met unanimiteit alleen maar kunnen werken, met het recht van de sterkste kunnen werken, dan komen we niet meer tot afspraken op, op Europese schaal. Dat is eigenlijk uh, een, een zorg die ik heb voor de Europese samenwerking, maar dat is een zorg die ik ook heb in lidstaten. Als je kijkt, ik zie het ook op mijn eigen Facebookpagina. Het toenemend aantal mensen is helemaal niet meer geïnteresseerd in dialoog. Willen alleen maar een stelling poneren. En door de algoritmen die werken, zoeken mensen voortdurend alleen nog maar mensen op met wie ze het al eens zijn. En een democratische samenleving zonder dialoog is geen democratische samenleving meer. Dat is een nucleaire samenleving met allemaal individuele interessen die nooit bij elkaar zullen komen. En dat in de westerse wereld is waar mij waar ik mijn meeste zorgen over heb. En dat heeft een direct effect op onze vorm van Europese samenwerking. Maar niet alleen dat, ook op hoe onze samenlevingen individueel als lidstaten uh, functioneren. En ik denk dat de vluchtelingencrisis daar een mooi voorbeeld van is. Meneer Orbán kan alleen maar zeggen, door mijn hekken um, uh, red ik het, omdat hij parasiteert op de goede wil van mevrouw Merkel om het probleem op te lossen van de mensen die door de bal kan komen. Maar dat zegt hij natuurlijk niet thuis. He, en als dit de norm wordt in hoe we met elkaar omgaan, dan zal mevrouw Merkel kan ook niet eindeloos alleen maar uh, de problemen van anderen oplossen, want dan redt ze het thuis ook niet meer in een democratie. En dus mijn pleidooi is in dit soort discussies altijd, was het maar alleen een Europees probleem? Het is helaas inmiddels een probleem dat teruggaat tot de kern van al onze Samenleving en hoe we samenleven. Dus het afwijzen van compromis. Je hebt het ook in de Amerikaanse verkiezingen gezien. Je hebt geen politieke tegenstander meer. Nee, je hebt een vijand. En dan krijg je wat, wat in, de, in, de, in de theorie heet majoritarianism. Dat wil zeggen, alleen de meerderheid bestaat. Niet alleen de meerderheid bepaalt, maar alleen de meerderheid bestaat. Na de Amerikaanse verkiezingen, ik weet het nog heel goed, na de, de Democratic Party has ceased to exist. Ja. Mevrouw Clinton had wel 2,5 miljoen meer stemmen, maar ze heeft het niet gewonnen door het kiessysteem. Maar ze bestaat nog wel en haar, haar kiezers bestaan ook nog wel. En verdienen ook om gezien en erkend te worden in de samenleving. En dat is in Europa precies hetzelfde. En voor ons, nogmaals, voor onze vorm van samenwerking, omdat we allemaal minderheden zijn en omdat we allemaal relatief klein zijn, is de premisse dat de rule of law, de rechtsstaat, grenzen stelt aan jouw mogelijkheid tot democratisch handelen, is een uitgangspunt waar we geen afscheid van mogen nemen. Net zo goed als de democratie grenzen stelt aan de rule of law, want de grondwet wordt op democratische manier eh, vastgesteld. En Europese verdragen worden op democratische manier geratificeerd. Maar die balans dreigt zoek te raken in onze samenleving. Daar maak ik me veel zorgen over. En het herstel van die balans is het begin van het herstel ook van de Europese Unie. Boven op het balkon. Mr. Timmermans, uh, good evening. My name is Nick. I come from Greece. And uh, as we all know, 25 years later, here in our beautiful city in Maastricht, the European Union was actually burned. Uh, uh, we had the birth of the European Union. Sorry for my English. <laughs> I, so, I thought you said birth, but you said <laughs> born. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and so uh, we're here. I was looking for the fire, but. Uh, 
<laughs> and we are here 25 years after the Maastricht Treaty, and we have a European Union in crisis in many sectors. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have. We have Mr. Putin at the east, Mr. Trump at the west. We have Mr. Erdogan playing games in the Mediterranean, a huge immigration crisis, a huge economical crisis, especially in the southern countries. And my question is, and I want if you can, if you could a clear answer, how high is the level of danger that the European Union is in right now? And how big, how big is the problem that we all face right now. And furthermore, I study European law. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what is it in the Merchant of Venice? Uh, first thing we do, kill all the lawyers. But um, uh, <laughs> Shakespeare, it's not me, Shakespeare. Um, but um, in answer to your question, and I really thank you for your question. And uh, you, know, uh, you, you come from a country that has suffered more than any other country, both in terms of the economic crisis, but also the migration uh, uh, crisis. Um, and yes, uh, your country and its politicians, its political class, have a huge responsibility for the economic crisis you got into. Um, but that doesn't, um, you know, uh, take away the responsibility we have collectively to not let one of our member states go down the drain. Hmm? Uh, so I think. You know, with the efforts now undertaken by the Greek government, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel, even though the tunnel is still extremely long. But having said that specifically on, on, on Greece, let me now focus on, on the main uh, question. And that's why I'm glad it's somebody from your generation, my kids' generation, who asked the question. This thing can go bust. Yes, the European Union can fail. Yes, the European Union can fall apart. In these historic events, and I, d I quoted the example of uh, uh, the uh, uh, end of the German divide or the European divide, it was completely unthinkable in 85 to many people. It was absolutely logical in 89 to the same people. Like other historic events, the Russian Revolution, unthinkable in the beginning of 1917, unavoidable in November 1917. So, we tend to have um, a, a too casual look at our history and the possibilities of historic turns. If you, if you were to ask four months ago in the United States, what, are, what is the likelihood of Mr. Trump being elected president? I mean, are you crazy? It's never going to happen. Look at what he said. But it happened. So my worry with your generation, sir, is that you believe that everything you see is completely self-evident, is self-evident. Sadly, it is not. Sadly, one currency is not self-evident. Sadly, a borderless Europe is not self-evident. Sadly, the European Union is not self-evident. It's high maintenance, and we've been neglecting maintenance for the last 15 years because of understandable reasons, and it's high time everyone, including your generation, comes to terms with the fact that this thing could actually disintegrate. And I think that would be a terrible waste. Yes, in the future we will come up with something much better, much more beautiful, much more efficient than the European Union, I'm sure. But until we get there, let's try and keep what works well and let's try and improve what does not work. Because our common destiny as Europeans, given the fact that our place in the world is becoming smaller. It's not so long until we are only 10% of the world's population. It's not so long until we're only 20% of the world's economy. If you want to safeguard our values, we'll need to do it collectively. Individually, we will not be able to do it. So please, if you believe in what I say, or if you have different views on this, act. Because it is not self-evident that our European Union will still be there in five years from now if we do not understand that we have a collective responsibility to make sure it remains there and it's improved and it delivers what our citizens expect of it. In the back, there is a question, ah, achteraan. 
Yes. Um, I'm German. I'm also German. My, My Dutch, Dutch language skills are not that good, so I speak in English. Um, yeah, my background, I'm, I'm studying management of learning in the master degree. Um, so I'm interested in learning more broad in education. Um, a lot of things you mentioned already about um, yeah, morality, about it actually the, the culture of European um, Union, um, unifying countries, unifying people. Um, I think a, a fundamental basic, um, yeah, importance role there is education. So we have to start with young people. I believe in youth. I believe in myself that I can change something and not take it for evidence. Don't, don't take it for granted because this is how we come there where we are so far. So I think it is important that also the European Union plays a role in education. So where do you see the, the role of the European Union? If we were to end our evening today on this note, I would go home a happy man. I'm so glad with what you've just said. And I share your views uh, completely. I was talking earlier about a society where we see the person who's different not as an opponent but as an enemy, which precludes dialogue. You know, you don't talk to an enemy. You fight an enemy. You destroy an enemy. But an adversary you talk to. An opponent you talk to. And one of the downsides of the information society we see now, and, and many of us, especially your generation, younger people being online all the time, is that because of the algorithms used, the temptation of being prisoner of the same opinion is huge. And if you're prisoner of the same opinion, you cannot even imagine that people would have another opinion. Or you imagine that people with another opinion probably aren't people. That is what threatens our diverse society. So to lose the capacity to look at the world through the eyes of another person. And sir, I couldn't agree more. If we lose that capacity, we lose what is the essential element of our educational system since the late Middle Ages, which is to educate our youngest generation in critical thinking. That is the whole point of education. And let's make sure that the internet age does not eliminate critical thinking, but goes back to sort of a mythology-based post-truth way of thinking, which I think is on the rise. Um, and the only thing I wish for my children and their children at some point is that they find educators like you, sir, who look at them and then say, I'm going to help you to learn to think in a critical way about your own assumptions, about your surroundings, about your peers, and about people you don't know anything about, but would be good for you to learn to know them. We need to restore these links in our society. We need to educate, we need to elevate, we need to bring optimism back with our young generation. That will save us. We are not in a desperate position. We can fix this, but we will come in a desperate position if we lock ourselves in a view that is only ours, and if we lose the capacity to critically assess our own assumptions. So yes, education, education, education. Um, no, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes, from the royal law. <laughs> there you are. Her Majesty. <laughs> your, your name is Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bridget, sorry. There's a mic, there's a mic. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bridget, and yeah. there you go, Brexit. I'm a Brit, and I was wondering, after Brexit, what do you think the future of the European is, PN is without Britain, and what do you think Britain's future is for a lonely Brit that needs reassurance? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I said to, to, to uh, exactly a week ago, exactly a week ago, I sat on a podium uh, with um, Boris Johnson, <laughs> and... Um, I said to him two things. One, whether the UK is in or out of the European Union, 
the UK will be a European nation deeply involved in European affairs. That's the first remark I made. The second remark I made was, if, however, down the road, for some reason, we respect the result of the vote, we respect it and we work on it to make this divorce as amicable as possible. We respect that. But if somewhere down the road, for some reason, the British people would reconsider, <laughs> I can assure you that 500 million Europeans would welcome you back with open arms. <laughs> and, and honestly, I strongly believe that. I strongly believe that. He was not happy with my comments. <laughs> he said, the Commission should not be saying anything about this. this. You should stay out of this. By the way, we're paying your salary. <laughs> and I said to him, dear Boris, the same people are paying your salary as the people who are paying my salary. That's the taxpayers. But apart from that, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, everyone respects the vote. That's not a point of discussion. And the consequence of that vote is that we're going to see the, the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. But don't ask us to be happy about it. We are not. I passionately believe that the United Kingdom belongs in the European Union. That doesn't mean that I don't respect the vote. On the contrary, I do. But I still have my own beliefs. And I think, you know, which has grown together in 40 years, regardless of the difference. Um, is going to be very difficult to separate and probably in some areas we will stay very closely together. Anyway, having said that, let me end on a pun. Uh, a friend of mine who said, you know, in the last 40 years, the Brits have always had one foot in the European Union and one foot out of the European Union. After Brexit, this will be the other way around. <laughs> 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 Yes. No, behind, behind you, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, I'll take mine as uh, Bridget's question. Uh, with 48% of the British people <laughs> voting... <laughs> no, it's not. It, it, it's Sam, so uh, a little bit different. Uh, <laughs> with 48% of the British people voting to remain in the European Union, how can the EU help to secure the British citizens' rights as European citizens? How can they protect the rights in the EU? Mm. I had a, a discussion with another Brit who's a passionate believer in, in Brexit, uh, Bill Cash, in, in, in Slovakia somewhere. And he was making the point, the British people have decided, the British people have decided, the British people have decided. And my, my point is, is it so difficult to say the majority of the British people have decided? You know, in any election, uh, don't pretend or referendum that the people who didn't carry the day suddenly sort of disappear. They're still there. And they are entitled to their opinion just as much as the people who carry the day in the referendum. And let's listen very carefully to their opinion, what their expectations are. Now, at this stage, of course, we're waiting for uh, the British government to um, send us the notification of, of uh, Article 50 of the treaty. So we will not start negotiating or making declarations before that uh, point. But it is quite clear that if any British government wants to make a success of this, it is in their best interest to make sure that they gather together as many Brits as possible who would then see their views reflected in the position of the British government. And we'll, we'll be waiting for that. And incidentally, even though, you know, 48% disagreed with the decision, I don't see that 48%, um, you know, fighting against it. They accept it. They accept it, which is logical. In a democracy, you accept that, like we accept it. But to accept a vote does not mean you have to like it. Uh, to accept a vote is to accept the rules of democracy and to act upon those rules. And as I said before, I believe in our 
systems in our democracies, and this is something that goes back to the writings of the great Greek historian uh, Thucydides, democracy is at least as much about protecting the position of minorities as it is about imposing the will of a majority. Balcony. Thank you very much for being here for us. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Meropi, and I'm a European law student at Maastricht University. Uh, my question for you. Where are you from? I am from Cyprus, from the Greek part of Cyprus. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit concerned nowadays about the Cypriot conflict, in, if you know about it. And I would like to know your opinion and your stance on the issue. And to what extent do you think that uh, Turkey affects Cyprus in? finding a resolution for, for the Cypriot conflict. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I have to say this, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you, you, you're, you're, you're looking for reasons to be cheerful, to quote Ian Jury. Um, I think this is a reason to be cheerful. Uh, the talks on the solution of the Cyprus uh, problem have been really very constructive, and all sides are committed to trying to find a solution. And I have no reason to criticize uh, the Turkish government on that. I see a clear will to be constructive and to find solutions. Uh, I also am a great admirer of uh, the president of the Republic of Cyprus, who is also sticking out his neck to try and find a solution of the problem. I also see that the Prime Minister of Greece says he wants to be a positive influence. on. The so if you look at the, the main parties involved in all of this, including the leadership of the Turkish community uh, in Cyprus, there is a strong willingness to come to a solution. Well, of course, in any conflict that's been going on uh, for more than 40 years, the devil will always be in the detail. And we are not there yet. But I remain very optimistic because of the strong willingness on the side of all parties to try and find an equitable solution to this problem. And wouldn't that be a great, great gift to Europe if we could finally, finally put an end to this fratricidal uh, conflict at the heart of Europe. You're in the front. Good evening. Um, my name is Matthias, I'm from Austria, and I'm a student of European Studies here at the university. And my question is, Nowadays, you frequently hear this argument of your skepticists that the European Union is over-regulating each and every aspect of everyday life of its citizens. And you, um, as a commissioner, are, I think, yes. um, yeah, one of your responsibilities is better yeah. regulation. Yes, I wanted um, to know where do you see your success or have, have you had some um, betterment in this? Yeah. on these issues. Could you elaborate well, on is, that? This is not something you, you, you would see very often in, in, in the public debate, but I think, you know, we're doing quite well, thank you. Uh, uh, we've now come up with the, the third Commission work program for the next year. It's the third time that we limit our proposals to 23-odd proposals, which used to be more than 100 every year. The first year, I had a very, very antagonistic European Parliament. You're taking away all our initiatives. What are we going to do? Uh, how are we going to have enough rapporteurs and all of that? And they didn't like it one bit. And they also thought that better regulation meant lowering social standards, lowering environmental standards, etc. Better regulation is simply creating better laws and removing laws that are no longer good. Three years down the road, we have an agreement with the Council and the European Parliament to work like this every year. Today, this year's Commission work programme went down in the European Parliament very smoothly. It's as though we've never done anything <laughs> differently, which I think is a great success. Indeed, only 23 initiatives uh, for next year. And we're also removing a lot of stuff that was on the shelf, just taking it off. We're withdrawing legislation as well. Let me give you one concrete example of what we did this week. There was a lot of criticism over the years of nature directives, birds and habitat directives. I undertook a review. I said, 
Let's look into this. There's so much criticism of that. Let's see if these directives are still fit for purpose. The assumption in the environmental world was, oh my God, this Timmermans is going to slash it and he's going to lower environmental protection and there's going to be uh, a parking lots in nature, uh, reserves, etc. And we undertook this, in, I think, in a very pragmatic way to just have practitioners advise us, is this working, yes or no? And if it's not working, why not? Okay, I admit it took us a lot of time, but it's also one of the first huge reviews we've uh, done. But this week I was happy to be able to show with a lot of good analysis and empirical data that these directives do not need to be changed. They are fit for purpose. What we need to do is do a lot better in implementation of these directives. And there is a lot of what we call gold plating by member states and by local authorities. So they use the directive as a pretext to add on more regulation. That's where we need to do a lot of work. But, you know, and then the nature organizations were, oh God, we won, we won. Uh, and I, I, I agree with them, they won because we don't change it. But my reasoning was very, not political, it was very technical in the sense I was looking, is this still delivering what we need? And the conclusion was yes. So it was counterintuitive because so many people were saying this doesn't work, it's too detailed, et cetera. But now I can prove to people, shut up about this. It's nonsense what you're saying, look. And that is how we can step by step diffuse myths about Europe. Uh, myths that very often were even created by the same Boris Johnson we talked about earlier. We even said that there were European regulations for condoms that determined the size of the condom based on the nationality of the user. I mean, he wrote it in a newspaper. <laughs> and that's a sort of myth that once you put it out there, it's, it's no longer something that uh, people sometimes believe. What, you know, um, amazingly, people sometimes believe what journalists write um, on these things. In the back. No offense the to the journalists in yes. the room, I hope. My name is Claudia Marcu, I'm from Romania. Um, because we are here in Maastricht just before uh, 9th of uh, December, I want to know, uh, I know that you are always involved in uh, European politics. Um, what were you doing 25 years ago, <laughs> exactly, when uh, the Treaty of Maastricht uh, uh, was born? Uh, how did you look at this treaty and how do you look now after your experience in over the years. Exactly 25 years ago, I served as a diplomat in Russia, in Moscow. And exactly 25 uh, uh, years ago, you know, I was looking around and looked at this collapsing Soviet Union and what, we, what our response would be. That's why I also gave the answer I gave earlier uh, to, to you, uh, sir. I was very much aware that things in Europe were changing fundamentally and I could see that very clearly in Moscow and I was looking at the rest of Europe and I saw this huge surge of optimism in Poland, in the Czech Republic, in the Baltic states, in Romania, uh, in Bulgaria, in other countries were saying hey we got this freedom and my feeling was it might last, it might not because democracy was so fragile and the big difference between Russia and the other countries was that Russia didn't feel liberated. Liberated from whom? From themselves? From communism? They felt something was collapsing. And very quickly, they had a completely distorted view of what market economy and democracy was, because the people in charge were distorting that view. And I, my, my impetus was to say, okay, let's get things in order in the part of Europe where this seems to be working. That was what I thought at the time. And I have never been able to look at the Maastricht Treaty as the treaty where the EMU was born, where the Euro uh, uh, emanated from. For me, the Maastricht Treaty, and you might disagree with me, lawyers certainly will, but from my perspective, where I was at the time, the Maastricht Treaty was the first step of the old Europe to accommodate the reality of the new Europe. That's how I will always look at the Maastricht Treaty. With all, you know, with all the faults in it, because it was only, you know, since the Maastricht Treaty, Amsterdam, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the treaties were never complete. 
They always had leftovers. We even called them leftovers. And that's because the geopolitical situation in Europe was changing so quickly. The law can never, you know, in, in a cataclysmic institutional, economic, or political change, law will always lag behind. And that's what you saw here as well. And we're still in the middle of fixing that, and it will take us quite some time. Homo Sovieticus isn't dead everywhere. Now, in the, in the red. Hello, good evening. Um, I was wondering whether you believe that the European Union would What's be... What's your name and where are you from? Denise, I'm from Austria. Okay. Hi. Um, so I was wondering whether you believe that the European Union would become a federation at some point. Or well, that's yeah. 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 <laughs> I understand your, your question. It, it, uh, the, the, the easy way out, which is also a bit, uh, a bit cowardice, is to say it's sui generis. This is a lawyer's way out. And all the lawyers here will know this. Um, but of course, in political science, you want to compare it to, to other existing or uh, previously existing political constructions. And I find it extremely difficult to compare it. I think one of the things we need to, to get rid of is um, this idea that you saw, especially after 91, that because of the end of the European divide, everyone would become like us like us being in the West, with the same view, etc., etc. It's nonsense. So the end of the European divide is not just a transformational process for the economies and societies in Eastern Europe. It has led to a transformational process of the situation, societal situation, economic situation in the West of Europe as well. And where sometimes in Germany, Germans will know this, you talk about ostalgie, about sort of a, a false nostalgia of a past that never was, one of the reasons of the success of nationalism in Western Europe is vestalgie, creating a past of the West that actually never was, to portray that as a promise for the future. If we keep all these strange people and different people out, we'll be happy again. This is a very dangerous line of thinking, I would, I would say. Austria, case in point. If we look at the political debate in Austria today, because my father served in Austria in, in the 1970s, and he went back there in the end of the 80s and back there again uh, in the early parts of this millennium, I had sort of snapshots of Austria in different periods, and Vienna specifically. When I first went to Vienna in the 70s, this was a gray city, a poor city, a city on the borders of Europe. The borders of civilization was the feeling you had when you, was there, when you were there. People were not happy. People did not trust each other. And now Vienna is one of the richest cities in Europe. Is people are still not happy, but for other reasons. <laughs> not happy enough, I would say. But if you look at the transformation of Vienna as a city, which is now, apart from what's happening politically in Austria, I don't want to go into that, but Vienna has become truly a cosmopolitan open city where you can actually see and smell the whole of Europe, uh, on the market spaces, uh, in the city streets, in the shops, all the time. And where the Nazis in the Second World War ripped out Vienna's soul by killing the Jews, Vienna is now reconstructing its soul based on this multicultural, open society. And I think this is a great gift if I compare that to Vienna in the 1970s. How can you be nostalgic about that Vienna if you have this Vienna? I don't understand it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, there. Yes. Somebody's adamant up there, <laughs> waving. Waving, oh yes, okay. Hello, my name is Gergely, uh, and I come from Hungary. And, um, let me reflect some of the concerns here in this room. Um, well, I was born in a EU, in a Europe which uh, wasn't divided anymore, and I was raised in an Europe which was uh, which has been already united. And you said you 
you have concerns about that this generation may cannot um, appreciate this um, this very great thing that we, we got. And I'd like to assure you that I've met lots of young Europeans here in Maastricht and across Europe who are ready and who are willing to, to fight for this common future. And yeah, I can speak just for myself, but uh, I can promise that I will. Um, but... <laughs> But also, here is a question to you. Um, the EU was created to, to ensure security in the continent and to feel secure. And that is one thing that truly concerns me today, that the citizens of the EU do not feel secure anymore. And, and my question is why? And I'd like to also ask you to, to, to tell some steps that the Commission is willing to take, not visions, I study EU law, so I'm full of visions, <laughs> um, but steps what the Commission is willing to take to facilitate the increase of security here uh, in the EU. Because we heard that your colleague Federica Mogherini just recently referred to the EU as a superpower, which um, I'm glad to hear, but we have to grow up. We have to grow up to the task. So, so how are we going to do that? That's my question. Well, first of all, let me say very clearly, um, one of the, re the main reason I'm an optimist is because of your generation. You are the best educated, the healthiest, the best connected, the most international, most European generation in European history, which is a great gift, a great gift don't need to be thankful to your parents, but it's still a great gift. <laughs> use, it, use it well, is all I'm saying. Use it well because this European construction is not indestructible. Like, nothing that was made by man is indestructible. So, that's my only point, uh, and I have great trust in you. The only thing I don't see you do enough, in my view, but that's my generation talking, is mobilizing. You have great ideas, but all too often, you believe that once you put them on Facebook, that's fine. Frankly, you know, the, the feeling to get organized is something you need to discover, and I hope it will, I think it will happen soon, frankly. I'm quite optimistic. On the issue of, of feeling insecure, of course this is linked with, you know, we're in, the, we're in the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. Everything's going to change. Everything's going to change worldwide at a speed that we have not seen ever before. Are people, do fe people feel insecure because of that? Yes, of course. Like in any industrial revolution in human history, people feel insecure because they know things are going to move and it's not sure that they will have a good place in the new world. So what our primary task is to show, to demonstrate that there is a place for people in that new world, in a sustainable economy, in a changed economy, in a more united economy, and we have to demonstrate that, to take away that almost existential feeling of insecurity. And of course, a, no a number of other elements of insecurity come on top of that. Uh, terrorism is seen as a great threat. Migration is seen as a great threat. Diversity is seen as a great threat. Incidentally, diversity is seen as a greater threat in countries that are not diverse yet than in countries where diversity is the norm. Interesting, huh? You fear more what you don't know than what you're familiar with. It's also a human phenomenon, I think. So if you ask me how can we concretely do something about this fear, I think this would have happened also with President Clinton, but it's going to happen even more quickly with President-elect uh, Trump. We will have to take a greater responsibility for our own security as Europeans. Yeah, does this mean more defense spending? Perhaps, but it certainly means better defense spending. We're wasting too much of taxpayers' money because we all want to have our own little armies separately from each other. I'm not advocating European army, by the way. I'm saying, why don't we sit down as European countries and look at what we're good at and concentrate on that and trust our neighbor to do what they're good at and that we're able to do this effort together in the future. I think that would be a, a, a sound approach that we can do relatively quickly, and Federica is indeed working on that. So that is protecting 
ourselves against external threats. We also need to do a better job of protecting us, ourselves against threats coming into Europe. Terrorism, organized crime, smuggling rings. Still, we don't exchange enough information between security services. Still, our police forces are not integrated uh, enough. Still, we don't have watertight uh, uh, external border control, although we are quickly improving that now also by the European Border and Coast Guard. So that's also an element of security we can work on. But um, I risk being sounding a bit slightly Marxist now. That's not my intention. But I absolutely believe that much of the insecurity felt by people is insecurity about their socio-economic position today and tomorrow. The fear of loss of position is what you see. And the reaction to that, sadly, is a traditional European reaction, nationalism. And nationalism, to quote former President uh, François Mitterrand, a patriot is somebody who loves his country. A nationalist is somebody who hates, hates other countries. And what we desperately need is European patronism. What we desperately need to get rid of is European nationalism. This, I believe, is one of the challenges of your generation, and if I could be of any assistance, I'm here to serve. But I believe European patriots are people who believe in the values of Europe. And if they don't like the Commission or the Parliament or Brussels, who cares? I don't. We're only instruments. But if they s like the values our societies are based on, let's fight for these values. That's how we bring back a sense of security. Let's become European Patriots. We have time left for two questions. The first one, the balcony on my left. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maria. I'm from Slovakia, and this question comes from my parents. They are now back in Slovakia. So it's sure that European Union brought a lot of benefits to smaller countries like Slovakia, otherwise I could not be here. But there's also thing that nobody really talks about. What happened is that the superpowers of, or the companies from the more developed countries, they bought the companies that are in the smaller countries, like for example in Slovakia. I will give you an example. There is now a company, a French company, who bought the whole water and energy system in Slovakia, and now they are becoming monopoly. What it means that they now can change the prices, and many other companies in Slovakia are not Slovak anymore, so they, they don't, we don't own anything anymore. So my question is, what do you think about it, and how can we maybe solve this? Solve this where does it lead? And the second question afterwards, if, if it happens that the European Union collapse, what do you think, what is going to happen with this? <laughs> that all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On, on your first, on your first you question. Much. On your first question. Uh, it's, uh, it's not an answer I like to give, but I have to give it. There's nothing in European law or in the European Union that says to member states, you have to sell your uti utilities to the highest bidder or to a foreign company. This is nothing. Brussels has dictated to Slovakia. This is a decision taken by the Slovaks. We have scores of member states where public utilities like water are still in private hands. Uh, that is, uh, sorry, in public hands. That is not a problem of European law. Having said that, I know full well, and I, I was talking to Polish Deputy uh, Prime Minister about the same subject uh, earlier this week. I know full well that if your economy is organized differently and is more focused on traditional state-owned companies who then have to enter into the market, then this incredible force of the traditional Western European conglomerates or even North American conglomerates is something very difficult to, to withstand. But at the stage we are now, I think if I look at, at countries in Central Europe, firmly in control more and more of their economy, but also where small and medium-sized enterprise has huge opportunities. You know, the, the, we're moving towards a more sustainable economy. We're moving towards a energy union. This offers huge opportunities for SMEs. 
And if the problem is a lack of funds for investment, there's the Juncker plan that will offer that investment through the European Investment Bank. And so I would say that a clear economic program by member states based on transforming the economy to take into account the future economic development is a huge opportunity in Central and Eastern Europe, also given the flexibility that's been built up in those economies. On your question about the apocalypse, um, what will happen? Well, if history teaches us anything, that anything can happen. Um, you know, I'm, again, I'm not uh, predicting the end of days uh, for the European Union. I think we have a very bright future. I think we have huge opportunities. I think we see the first indications of things going better. Um, public debt is going down across the European Union. Um, budget deficits are going down across the European Union. Unemployment is going down across the European Union. Youth unemployment is still at a c an incredibly high rate, unacceptably high rate. But there are some positive indications as well. There are also huge opportunities in the energy sector, in the circular economy sector, in the digital single market. But we need to seize those opportunities. The only thing I'm trying to say all the time, it is not for sure that if we do nothing, we'll be okay. There's, there's, there's another revolutionary time I want to refer to, the 19th century in Italy. There's a, one, one of the most beautiful novels ever written about a revolutionary time is called Il Gatto Pardo by Tommaso di Lampedusa, which is a, a wonderful Italian novel. And there's a, a guy called Tancredi who says he will join the revolution, the unity of Italy. And his adopt, uh, adoptive father says to him, but, but why? Don't you want the world to stay as it is and stay in the kingdom of Naples, two Sicilies? And Tancredi then says to him, but if we want things to stay the same, in terms of the values, everything will have to change. And I think this is true in every time of fundamental societal change. But also in times of fundamental societal change, the knee-jerk reaction is very often exactly the opposite. Things are changing. If I stay still, hide, and don't move, things will be all right. And that would be an absolute mistake of historic proportions if we believed that by doing nothing, everything will turn out all right. That's the only case I'm trying to make. We need to get a move on with this. But if we do, and if your generation takes charge of that, we'll be all right, I'm absolutely sure. What a beautiful evening where Il Gato Prado is recommended by a European commissioner to the audience and warmly <laughs> underline that. The last question will come from the Loge on my left. Ja, jij bent Nederlands, dat kan ook het Nederlands. Ja, maar ik ga het toch in het Engels doen. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> mijn naam is, uh, or my name is Helle Huisman, and I study at the University College of Maastricht. And um, I just want to go back to this word uh, mobilization that you've been using quite a lot. And I think looking around this room, I recognize a lot of people um, of politically minded student organizations, myself included. Um, and we have been, you know, trying to uh, mobilize the youth, but there is a lack, in my opinion, of uh, communication from the European leadership, what they're actually looking for in mobilization movements. We can talk about education and that that is necessary, but as young people, we can't really do much about that aspect of society. So what for you are the most essential, necessary elements of student mobilization um, that we can actually do, that we can actually implement? I'll give you a politically correct answer in saying we've just created the European Youth Corps. You can join that and do voluntary work in places where there is a need of young people to do something for their fellow man. I think that's a perfectly honest answer to your question. Uh, but I'll give you an even <laughs> more direct answer to your question. The question is wrong. You know, if, if, if your generation is going to sit 
uh, in the ballroom on the fringes with a little book waiting for us to write our names to come and dance, it ain't gonna happen. If you want to take the institutions, if you want to change politics because you don't like politics as it is today, hell, don't wait for an invitation. Get organized in your way, in your image. But if you want to change the institutions, you need to get into the institutions. And you know, you guys are so bright, so healthy, so well organized, so wealthy by and large, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. And that's where I think there is a, sort of a, 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 a cognitive dissonance between our two generations. I didn't go up to my parents' generation and say, oh, pretty please, could we be part of this? No, you went there and you did your best and you fought and you had a confrontation and they hated you for it and at the end of the day they let you in. You know, it takes a fight, it takes a fight. Believe Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he says, change takes a fight. It's necessary for you to do that. You're too complacent. Be angry at me because I say this, fine. But think about it as well. Critical thinking, I think it's very important. And again, this world is not going to change itself. And there are hundreds of millions of Asians of your age who are changing their world as we speak. They don't wait for others to get invited to do that. There are people in Africa becoming increasingly desperate, your generation, because they want an education, they want to use that, and they see a small minority of people taking everything into their own hands and not letting them take part in this. This is what needs to be mobilized, more social equality, uh, fighting the huge rise of inequalities. And I would also say, because let's be frank, if I look across the room here with the young people here, you don't need to be convinced by me in terms of Europe. Most of you would agree with that vision. But do something, I would ask you, passionately, look for people from your generation who are not as lucky as you are in your society. Look at their world, how they see the world, how they see their opportunities, why they are angry, why they are not optimistic but very pessimistic. Look at the world through their eyes because as much as I admire your generation, I will not continue saying it, you are also already a divided generation between those people who are optimistic and those who feel that this society is not for them. And please make sure you don't leave anyone behind. We are in this fucking mess because we left too many people behind. Don't repeat that mistake for heaven's sake. Leave no one behind. Thank you very much for your attention this evening. So thank you very, very much for your lively participation in this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Timmermans, for a very rich, very broad-ranging, yet very in-depth and open conversation. And bedankt voor de samenwerking tussen onze beide organisaties om dit voor elkaar te krijgen. We zijn heel dankbaar en blij dat het zo'n mooie en open conversatie kon worden. Dank u wel en dank u, meneer Timmer. En applaus voor Mathieu Segers en University College Maastricht.